Imagine there are no photographs, no paintings, no imagery. All you know is the world you see around you now and the world you yourself remember. What would that mean for your life? What would you know about your great-grandparents or about your aunt who lives on the other side of the world? You probably wouldn't realize it, but you would be missing out on a lot. As humans, we have an innate need to understand our past and our place in this world. For example, by looking for our birth parents, by doing genealogical research, or by looking to religion for creation stories. Knowing our past creates an awareness of the continuity and the attachment to our personal narrative. And it provides a sense of belonging and a connection to our roots. But how deep do those roots go? I and other paleontologists have taken it upon ourselves to do genealogical research for the entirety of humanity. And we try to paint a picture of all our relatives, past and present. And just like a genealogist would look at family relationships, births and deaths, we look at um, evolutionary connections and the origination and extinction of species. And you will see that we are more similar than we are different, and you will hopefully get a new appreciation for um, the other creatures that we share this world with. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I will show you our family photo album, looking at evolution going back in time. It's not yet complete, and a lot of genealogical research remains to be done. But I can already show you from whom you inherited your big head and your hairy legs. So let's start with our parents, the ones that came immediately before us. We can recognize many of our defining features in our ancestors. For example, our ancestors used simple tools made of natural materials, such as sticks, stones, and bones. But over time, they developed more sophisticated ways of creating tools. And our brains also increased over evolution. And it was likely our intellect and our ability to use tools that was the key to our survival in a changing environment but also our posture. Our ancestors likely already started walking on two legs around four to six million years ago, but the first unequivocal evidence for that comes from fossilized footprints in Tanzania that date back to around 3.6 million years ago. Our own species, Homo sapiens, might feel like an only child, but in fact, we had several siblings that only recently went extinct. For example, the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals were robust and strong, and they had a stocky build with heavy eyebrows. They had no chin, and they had a larger brain than we did. But despite these differences, they were similar enough that interbreeding took place between them and us until their extinction around 40,000 years ago. And most of us actually still have some of their DNA inside our cells. Now, every family also has this one child, you know who it is. And in our human family, this is the hobbit from Flores in Indonesia. Unlike the Neanderthals and ourselves, it had a brain the size of a chimpanzee's. It was about yay big. It had long arms and big feet. In fact, it was so strange that there was a whole controversy about whether this was really a new human species or whether this was just a diseased Homo sapiens. 
in my own research on The Hobbit, I showed that many of its characters are actually quite normal, considering that it lived on an island. Islands provide startling examples of evolution and have inspired Charles Darwin himself. They are all extinct now, but we used to have giant pigeons, dwarfed elephants, and even a deer with five horns instead of the more customary two antlers. So compared to that, our little hobbit is no big deal at all. But let's not go down that rabbit hole. Let's have a look at our cousins. This would be the equivalent of looking at primate evolution. And just like cousins share a grandparent, we share a common ancestor with other primates around 25 million years ago. The word primate derives from Latin and means first rank, of course referring to our own perception of ourselves. But despite this rather egocentric view, we will see that we look very similar to other primates in many respects. We have forward-facing eyes and grasping hands with an opposable thumb. And this allows non-human primates high agility in the trees, but we have repurposed those features for complex tool use and manual dexterity. Primates also have complex brains with an enlarged neocortex. This is the outermost layer of the folded, wrinkly part of the brain, and it's responsible for complex thought, like future planning and problem solving. All primates, including ourselves, also display social behavior. So we form social groups, we establish hierarchies, we um, have cooperative behavior and complex communication systems. And this allows us to work together to, for example, find and obtain food. And this improves our access to a wide range of food sources, and it enhances our own nutritional intake. Now, humans have, of course, taken this to an extreme with the whole agricultural industry. Primates, including ourselves, are also capable of learning one another. This means that we don't have to repeat each other's mistakes. Cultural traditions also emerge through learning. And in fact, social bonding and relationships are so important to both ourselves and to other primates that we even learn to communicate with each other through sign language. Now, moving forward, we might want to look at our more distant relatives, the Uarcontic liars. This word consists of Uarconta, which means true rulers, again, referring to our own perception of ourselves. And this includes the primates, the tree shrews, and the flying lemurs. And gliars. This means dormice, and it includes the rodents, and the hares, the rabbits, and the pikas. And all these animals shared a common ancestor around 85 to 95 million years ago, even before the dinosaurs went extinct. Now, despite this wide range of strange relatives, we will still recognize ourselves in them. In your contact liars, the percentage of monogamy is much higher, up to five times higher than in other mammals. And many fathers take an active role in taking care of their children. In Uarconta, uh, we reach sexual maturity relatively late. And this means that we have time to experience the world around us before getting into child rearing. Many Uarconta also have long pregnancies and relatively few offspring. So, prioritizing quality over quantity, we nurture and care for our children for an extended period of time to make sure that they are off to a good start in life. So, what about the gliars? Well, in fact, they are so similar to us in terms of how their body functions that they are often used in medical laboratories. And because we can relate to them so well, they make really good pets. 
Now, perhaps as a next step, we will want to look at mammal evolution as a whole. And we are so distantly related that we might not immediately see the family connection, but as we look closer, we will find kinship. The story of mammals starts in the Jurassic, around 205 million years ago. Between the sleeping dinosaurs, an odd-looking creature kind of scurries along the forest floor. This is Morganucodon. Morganucodon is about the size of a rat, and it has a furry coat to keep itself warm and to protect its body. It also has a relatively large head compared to the other animals at the time in relation to its body size, and it has a well-developed brain. And although it lays eggs, rather than giving birth to life young, it already produces milk for its offspring and it takes care of them. So it contributes to their survival and their development, much like the platypus does today. Morganucodon represents a common ancestor. Sorry, I skipped a bit. We'll get back to that. Morganucodon represents a common ancestor from which all our present-day mammal lineages evolved. This includes the monotremes, like the platypus, the marsupials, like the kangaroo, and the placentals, like ourselves. So let's get back to the placentals. I mentioned your contagliers before, and my own research topic are squirrels. Red squirrels, against popular belief, do not hibernate. And their diet varies across the seasons. It's rather limited in winter, but it consists of both animal and plant food sources. And I want to find out how these animals can deal with having these seasonal changes, despite not holding a winter sleep. So how do we do this? Well, I use phenomics. And phenomics is the counterpart to the more famous genomics. And whereas genomics focuses on the DNA of the organism and is passed on from generation to generation, phenomics focuses on the morphology, what the organism looks like. And this is partly influenced by DNA, but it's also influenced by the environment. And in my research, my team and I have looked at the upper arm bones of squirrels using micro-CT scans. Micro-CT scans use X-ray radiation, and this allows us to look inside the bones, just like in the hospital. And what we found was that their bones actually change according to the seasons. So in winter and spring, when calcium-rich foods are scarce, the squirrel bones actually consist of relatively little bone material with thin bone walls. And in summer and fall, when food is plentiful, their bone walls are thicker and their bone volume is higher. And we think that these seasonal changes might be universal for all your contagliers, and that their survival could be influenced by climate change through changes in their bone morphology. So this is a line of research that we plan on continuing to pursue. Now, getting back to mammals as a whole, we are an extremely successful group due to many shared characteristics. All mammals are endotherms. This means that we can control our core temperature. We have hair, most of us, to contain our body heat. And this allows us to have high activity levels, which in turn allows us to take up many different roles in the ecosystem. All mammals also have repurposed two bones 
that are normally part of the lower jaw in other animals for hearing, namely um, the anvil and the hammer. And this allows us to have a much wider range of hearing and a much wider range of vocalizations, including this talk right now. Another thing mammals have in common is the fact that we are diphyodont. It means we have two sets of teeth. We have our milk dentition, when we still drink with our moms, and we have our adult teeth, which are specialized for our particular diet. So if you'll have a look at your favorite feline's teeth when you get back home tonight, you will see that those are perfectly adapted for cutting meat. Right, so all mammals share millions of years of history. And just like a family, despite our differences, we are mostly the same. And just like we would sorely miss our grandmother if she would pass away and would no longer be in the family photographs, we would miss our fellow mammals if they went extinct. So let's all commit to making sure our next family picture includes everyone. Thank you. Thank you.